Okay, uh, we'll start. So it's been a while, I guess, since I've seen you in person uh, between reading week and uh, being away last week. And then, uh, so since the social engineering component was online, uh, well, first off, is there any questions about anything other than the lecture? So your assignment two uh, will be due in a few weeks. I, let's see what it says. So April 5th, I guess that's still, what it's, yeah, it's about two weeks. Um, what we do today will be covered in assignment two. So you'll do the thing that we're going to talk about today in theory. Next class, we'll actually, I'll do that thing with something called TOR. Uh, so the thing that you're doing is called a cognitive walkthrough. It's not a mystery. Um, and so we'll do a cognitive walkthrough of TOR. So you'll get to see how you do it. Uh, and then you'll turn around and do it on your assignment for something else, okay? So you can start, you can get started on the assignment uh, this week, uh, or you can wait till next week. Uh, but, but ideally you would um, have put some thought and effort into uh, the assignment this week. Maybe everything short of the actual walkthrough itself, then you'll come next week, you'll see how it's done, and then you can do it. And if you ever wanna cheat and sort of look ahead uh, the videos from last year are up, so you could just watch that lecture if you really want to get started on your assignment early. Okay, um, so that's that's the only, I think, logistical thing. Um, okay, so the social engineering uh, stuff, are there any questions on it since you didn't have an opportunity to ask questions? Anything that wasn't clear, anything that I should go over, or was it all good, or no one watched it yet? So you can, uh, I mean, because the course now is just sort of like a topic about this, a topic about this, it doesn't matter what order you watch things in. But, but anyways, make sure you, make sure you watch it. Um, it won't be reflected on assignment two, but it will be reflected on the final exam, for sure. And hopefully it was fun. It's a lot of stories, uh, and so it uh, hopefully it wasn't boring. I'm actually, I'm sad that this was the one I did online because it's the most fun to do in class. Um, so, anyways, but it is what it is. Okay, so I don't see any protesting about it, so I uh, will move on to usability. Okay, so usability will be the next topic we look at. So usability, we've seen already. We've seen the UDS framework. So that was usability, deployability, security. And so we already know a bit about usability. Uh, I've said it before when we introduced the uh, framework that usability is important for security because if people can't use your system, they'll not use it or they'll use it wrong. Uh, and you could actually lower the level of security. At, at best, you just won't get any additional security, uh, and at worst, it, they might do things that are sort of dangerous. Um, okay. So what we're going to do in the next two lectures is, uh, in the evaluation frameworks, you just sort of picked some properties like columns, and you sort of said what you thought about usability, okay? So that's fine uh, if you're doing things like fast, but uh, if you're actually doing a product, you want to make sure you get the usability right. And so looking at something for five minutes and deciding whether it should be a full dot or a half dot is not sufficient. Okay, you want to do something a little more formal, a little more involved to try and really understand uh, what's, what's happening. Um, so that's what we'll do in this class is I'm going to go through three methodologies uh, that you can use. Okay, so pretend you have a new tool. It provides great security, but it's hard to use. Uh, users could make a lot of errors. Users might try to circumvent it, so they might try and go around it. And the way to go around it might introduce new security vulnerabilities, right? So like, for example, let's say, I don't know, like I want to use something on the university network, but the port is closed, right? Then, or actually at home or something like that. And so you might go into your router and change a bunch of settings and open up a whole bunch of ports and things like that so you could use some software, uh, but then you leave yourself vulnerable as a result. 
Uh, for most users, security is a secondary goal. So people aren't like, I, I'm going to be secure today. That's my goal today, right? Most people are like, okay, I, I want to get this thing done, right? And then I want to do it in a secure way as opposed to an insecure way. But my primary objective, my first objective is just to get it done. And then security is a second consideration. So security is going to stand in the way of the primary objective of getting something done then users are going to prefer to get it done as opposed to be, being secure, okay? So security, it's a, it's a nice to have. If you can do it and you can do it securely, that's better than not doing it securely. But if it's a difference between uh, getting it done in an insecure way or not getting it done in a secure way, you'll prefer to get it done. Uh, another sort of general principle about security and usability is that uh, if you warn users too much, they'll just ignore it. You've probably done it yourself. You get like these warnings and you just, you don't even know what it said. Like you just are like, okay, 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 or, or close, close, close kind of thing. Um, so they fatigue uh, to them. And so that kind of stuff works a little bit at first, but then it doesn't necessarily work forever. And security works best when it's in the background, meaning if you can just automatically have decisions made for users, uh, that's better uh, than having, asking them or getting them to go in and change settings and doing dialoguing and things like that. Um, it's, it's better to just take care of it. But sometimes you can't take care of it automatically, like different users will have different preferences. In that case, you want the software to sort of guide the user. So instead of it just turning on with a bunch of default options, if there was a, like a little wizard or something at the start that sort of helped them set it up correctly, uh, then that, that's the kind of preferable uh, way of doing it. And also the, the software should give feedback to the user so they kind of know the status of the software at all times. Also, um, I, I am sort of jumping into software. So usability is a general thing. It doesn't necessarily mean software. It could be hardware, it could be an object, it could be anything. Um, the study of usability started with software. So it was software people looking at user interfaces and things like that. So a lot of times I'll slip up and just say software or the slides will say software, but I, I wanna emphasize it's not limited to software. So all of these principles could apply to other things other than software itself. Uh, another thing is that developers and users are, are different. So developers really understand how the software works. They have a, a correct mental model of how the software works. They find it easier to make sensible decisions because they understand how it works. A user that comes in and uses the software, they don't know how it works or they don't care or they don't have time to learn how it works. They don't have a complete mental model of what's going on and so they're not gonna make the same decisions that a developer will make, okay? So you can't, if your developer comes and says, oh, I think this is usable, right? That doesn't mean a lot. It means it's usable to them but, and some, some tools are made for developers, right? So that, then that's fine. But if you're making a, a, a tool that actual people need to use that aren't developers, then you wanna try and figure out whether it's usable by actual users, not just your developers. Defaults are super important. So sometimes you, uh, you know, software comes with a set of defaults. They can be changed by users, but guess what? Most users aren't gonna change the defaults. They'll just go with the defaults themselves. Okay, so it's something to pay attention to. And uh, the other thing is mental models don't have to be perfect. Um, so the, okay, so I have a couple of slides. I, couldn't, I can't remember what the slides look like. So I have a few slides about some of these things, so I'll, I'll just put a pin in that and circle back to it. Okay, so uh, just as an example of why defaults are important, uh, this is an interesting result. It's from this book, Nudge. Uh, and this has nothing to do with computer science at all, okay? But it uh, just shows you. Um, so it turns out that when you get a driver's license, uh, one question that you're often asked or, or you're allowed to weigh in on is, let's say, you know, heaven forbid there is an accident and, and you die, uh, what do you want done with your organs? So uh, your organs could be donated to someone else that, that needs them or not donated, okay? And so this is a graph that shows basically the percentage of people who agree to donate their organs uh, if they were in a car accident. 
Uh, and it's sorted by country, and so these are a bunch of European countries, okay? So the first four countries are Denmark, Netherlands, UK, Germany. You can see it ranges from 4% to 27% of people. And then in Austria, Belgium, France, Hungary, Poland, Portugal, Sweden, it's like 85 to 99% of people agree, okay? Now, you can cheat and read the caption. Don't read it for a second. Why, why is there a difference between these countries? Why do you think? Okay, so it could be some sort of cultural thing, some sort of mindset, something like that. These countries are pretty similar, right? They're, they're similar. Uh, there's a lot of like free trade between them. Uh, a lot of people move freely. Like Belgium, for example, is basically like saddled between France and Germany. Half the people speak German, well, maybe a third speak German, a third speak French, and a third speak Flemish. Um, but you know, it's like, why does Belgium look more like France as opposed to Germany? Okay, so the answer to this question is, it's not actually cultural, that would be your first guess. The answer is, the reason I'm bringing it up, is defaults, okay? The difference between these countries are the defaults, okay? So in the first four countries, the default is that you will not donate your organs, and if you want to opt into donating your organs, you have to fill out an extra form. So you can donate your organs, you can not donate your organs. If you say nothing, like just give me my driver's license, you will be put in the bucket of not doing it. And if you do some extra work, then you can get on the list where you would donate your organs, okay? The last countries are the opposite, okay? So you get the driver's license, you're automatically enrolled. The default is that you're enrolled into donating your organs. You don't have to do that. You can opt out, but to opt out, you have to fill out a form, okay? So why is there such a difference? Is because a lot of people go with the default. So if the default is, no one wants to fill out the extra form, right? And so if the extra form gets you into the program, you're not gonna do it. If it gets you out of the program, you're not gonna do it, okay? So anyway, so defaults matter, and this whole book was like, you know, going through public policy and looking at all the defaults and, and trying to, you know, just by flipping the, the default, you don't actually take anyone's freedom away. Everyone's still free to make their own choice, right? But by flipping the default, you can go from 12% to 99% if you think it's a social benefit that people donate their organs, right? And so there were like nudge units, like the whole UK government had one where they would go through all their policies and look at the defaults and try and change things to, to steer people toward making decisions that, that the government wanted them to make. So security software is like this as well. Uh, mental models, uh, so mental models don't have to be perfect. Um, so for example, here's a car, here's a steering wheel, okay? Uh, if I turn the steering wheel to the right, what happens? Say I'm driving and I turn it like this, what happens? Okay, so the car starts going in that direction. If I turn it this way, this car goes in that direction. Okay, why, why when I steer, turn the steering wheel like this does the car start going in that direction? Okay, so the wheels are turning. So I'm turning the steering wheel and the steering wheel is turning the wheels. Fine. Okay, does the steering wheel actually turn the wheels? Like is it mechanically linked up so that, that the twisting motion on the steering wheel is actually twisting the wheels of the car? Okay, yeah, so the answer is sort of complicated, it depends, right? So if you have an older car, yes. If you have a really old car, you, there's no assistance, like, and they're really hard to steer, because you have to, like, the muscle strength that you put in is actually turning the wheels. On newer cars, there might be an assistance, but, but, but it is still mechanically connected. And then on a modern computer, or sorry, a modern car like today, there's a computer. So the steering wheel is really just a joystick or like a mouse or something like that. So when you turn it, you're sending a signal to the computer that you want the wheels turned, and then the, the computer will turn the wheels for you, but there's no actual connection between the two. Okay, um, if I turn the steering wheel like this, the wheels will turn like this, okay? Uh, is there ever a case where if I turn the steering wheel like this, the wheels would actually turn like this instead? Okay, uh, so it could be, that's a good guess, but it doesn't, so reversing you have to, you, the user has to change the direction that they're steering. So I wouldn't ask it if there was, wasn't a case. 
Okay, so most cars have a traction control system. So what does that mean? It means you hit ice, for example, and you start skidding, okay? And if I turn the wheel like this, or well, let's keep it the same way. If I turn the wheel like this, I'm not actually t so much telling the car I want to turn the wheels like this. What I'm really telling the car is I want to go that way, okay? Now, is there a scenario where uh, to go this way, I would actually turn the wheels the opposite way. And in a skid, that is possible, okay? So sometimes when you start skidding, you want to bring the wheels into the direction that's, that you're skidding out from so that it regains traction. And then once it regains traction, then you bring the steering back to the direction that you want to go, okay? So if you, if you oversteer, uh, then you lose traction and you'll keep, you won't regain traction. You have to almost, you have to bring the car back and then, and then you can start to coax it in the direction you want to go, okay? So technically it is possible that I turn the wheel like this and the wheels at least temporarily go like this before they start going like this, okay? Do you have to understand that to drive a car? You don't, okay? So the proper mental model is when I turn the steering wheel, you know, it doesn't actually turn the wheels and sometimes it might turn the wheels like this, but most of the time it will turn the wheels like this. You don't have to understand any of that. Maybe if you're a professional race driver or something like that, you want to understand that, okay? But for average people, you just have to know when I turn the steering wheel like this, I'm telling my car I want to go this way. It's going to figure out what to do with the wheels to make me go that way, okay? So security software is also like that. You don't have to educate your users on how to use it. You want them to use it correctly. Okay, so if they're telling you, I want to do this, you can figure out what it takes to do that. You don't have to, you know, explain it all to them. Okay, there's three uh, kind of methodologies that we'll look at. Um, so one of them is called an expert review. It's the easiest to do. So an expert review, as it sounds like, is you just have an expert that goes through the software and says, I think it's usable or I don't think it's usable. The second thing you do is um, you can do a user study. So a user study would be you would bring people, like say into a lab, you would make them do this, use the software and then you would uh, write down what they did or time things or, or take measurements or ask them questions, whatever. Um, and then you would try and learn how usable it is. And then there's a field study and a field study would be that you would actually give the software to real users, let them use it for a couple months and then uh, see, you know, you would ask some questions or get some measurements or something like that uh, from it, okay? Expert review is the easiest to do. You just need one person. User studies are a little bit more work because you got to bring people in. Field studies are the most amount of work because you're giving it to real users. You don't want it to mess up their work routine. Otherwise, it's costing money uh, for, for the companies that are implementing them. Okay, so we'll go through them one by one. Uh, we'll look at what they involve and sort of the pros and cons of each of them. Okay, so an expert review is conducted by one or a small number of experts. Sometimes maybe you use two or three and make sure they all agree uh, on it. Um, but, but anyways, the point is it's a small number. What does expert mean in this case? So what we do for an expert review is we try and get someone that we call a dual expert. So they're going to have expertise in two things. One thing is they're going to have expertise in usability. So they're going to know what usability processes are and things like that, okay? The other is they will have the proper mental model of how the software works, okay? So they need to be an expert in the software itself so that they understand that certain actions lead to bad consequences. They, they, they need to know that. Uh, and then they're also an expert on the usability side, okay? All of you, in assignment two will be a dual expert, okay? Now I know you aren't actually dual experts, but you're gonna play the role of it, okay? So I'm gonna try and teach you the usability side. Uh, you're gonna look at a, t a tool, uh, like a privacy cookie tracking tool. Uh, before you do your usability evaluation of it, you should learn a little bit about what it's doing, okay? What are cookies, why, why is it important to privacy, all that type of stuff. So that's part of what you can do across the, the next week and then when you see the cognitive walkthrough uh, in next class, uh, then you can, you can do the walkthrough yourself. Okay, so expert reviews have uh, the, the um, sorry, these slides are a little weird. Uh, it, was, it was just saying that there were, there were experts in usability and in the technology. Okay, cognitive walkthroughs, a kind of expert review. 
it's not the only one. Um, so there's a bunch of different processes that an expert can follow. Uh, most of them fall into one of two camps. There's cognitive walkthrough and heuristic evaluation. Um, if you think about software, this is roughly what heuristic evaluation is. Heuristic evaluation would be, you look at the user interface and you look at every button, you press every button and you see what it does, you go through every menu option, you see what it does, you basically try and catalog every option the software gets you from start to finish, okay? A cognitive walkthrough is task-based. So you sit down and you say, I'm gonna pretend I'm a user and this is email, so the user wants to send an email to someone else. And then you'll go through what you think the user would do to accomplish that task, okay? And if there's certain buttons that would never get pressed, you're not gonna, it's not gonna get covered by this kind of study, okay? Uh, but it, it is gonna be based on tasks itself, okay? Um, so anyway, so we're gonna focus on the cognitive walkthrough as opposed to the heuristic evaluation approach. So, so for example, to, to contrast them, you can think going back to cars, you might get a manual that comes with your car that's like 200 pages, and it tells you what every button on your car does, right? Um, uh, alternatively, actually, both manual, manuals have both kinds of things. They might say, hey, you have a flat tire, what do you do? And then they'll give you a step-by-step, -step, okay? So that's more of a cognitive walkthrough approach, and the, here's your dashboard, and here's the buttons numbered from one to 20, and number one does this, number two does that, number three does that, that's heuristic evaluation, okay? Both of them are good. They're not really better or worse than others, uh, but cognitive walkthroughs are, I think, better as students to learn uh, how to do. It's, it's less tedious, and it's, it's, just, it's, it's easier for you to conceptualize what, what you need to do. So that's why we focus on the cognitive walkthrough. Okay, so going, this is just for the cognitive walkthrough, not for the uh, heuristic evaluation. So for a cognitive walkthrough, what the expert will do is they'll pretend to be a user. So they're going to put themselves in the shoes of the user. They'll think a little bit about what's the kind of user that I want to emulate. So it might be like an advanced user or a basic user, uh, that, that kind of thing. Then what the expert will do is uh, pick a set of core tasks. Uh, that the user will want to accomplish. Um, so what they'll do is they're, like say it was email software, they'd say, I think a user wants to send an email, check whether they have new email, maybe sign an email message, maybe send an encrypted email, whatever. So you'll write down a bunch of tasks that you want to do, and that's what you're going to cover in your user study. Okay, so you're going to put yourself in the shoes of the user, and you're going to go through that task from start to finish, and you're basically going to try and conclude whether it was usable or not, okay? Now the last piece of thing you need is you need something that tells you whether it's usable or not. Particularly if it's not usable, why? Okay, so what we give you is a list of guidelines that basically say this is what usable software looks like. It should do this, and then if you notice that something's not usable, you try to assign it to one of these guidelines saying, oh, it violates this one guideline or another guideline, okay? So I, for your assignment two, I will give you the guidelines. So I'll give you eight guidelines, uh, and you can use them. You can invent your own or, or tweak the list if you want to, but uh, you won't have to come up with the guidelines. You'll come up with the core tasks, and you'll do the actual evaluation itself. Okay, so guidelines could be something like um, the interface is guiding the user through the task, uh, it's not using complex jargon or complex terms like, like we saw those SSL layers and they were like about servers and things like that, so and certificate authorities and things like that. So you, you, the guideline might say you should use easy to use understanding. You see one of those SSL warnings, you think this isn't usable, then you would say it violates this guideline. That's what you would write in your report, okay? So cognitive, rep it is a sort of a written report where you basically just walk through and you say, the system is doing good in terms of these guidelines, it's doing bad in terms of these guidelines. So next class I'll give you, we'll go through it with one piece of software from start to finish, okay? So you'll see everything uh, next class. But right now I'm just trying to give you the bird's eye view of, of all these different type of things. Okay, so the pros of using a cognitive walkthrough is that they're fast, uh, meaning that the you know, it's just one person that has to go through it. If you bring users in for a user study, you know, 
all of them have to go through the same process. So you have to repeat it 20 times or 100 times, depending on how many users you have. They're relatively cheap because you can hire one expert and they'll do the job. Uh, you don't have to um, you know, pay users to come in and things like that. And because an expert can work quickly, they can also cover a large amount of the software. They can explore lots of details of the software itself. Uh, the cons are basically that the expert makes a mistake. Okay? Uh, mistakes are always of two types, false positives, false negatives. So uh, the, the main one is that they might miss an issue. There might be an issue that real users have, the expert doesn't notice it, or because they understand the system better than a normal user, they're not able to, to, to do it. Um, the alternative is that they might think there's an issue there when there really isn't, right? So they might be very particular and say, oh, this, this looks bad, this looks bad. But then when you get real users in, they, they figure it out anyways, okay? So you might waste your time like, like trying to really perfect things as well. So that, that type of error is like less important. It's the, the first type of error is more important, but they're, they're both things to consider. Yeah, so heuristic valuation is um, uh, just that instead of doing core tasks, uh, what you'll do is you'll just open up the software and you'll go through it button by button, menu option by menu option. Like, I'm looking at Keynote, so like, what does this button do? What does this button do? What does this button do? You know what I mean? Yeah. What, is, what does this do? What does this do? What does this do? That's heuristic evaluation. So it's a very comprehensive, you look at everything, um, but there's no tasks involved. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that, that's a different way of phrasing the cons, which is the expert isn't the user, and so they're telling you what they think and they, they could be wrong, right? Uh, so they, they might not be able to emphasize, em, empathize enough with a normal user or, or like drop their expectations down to a normal user and so they might miss things as a result. Or basically they're, they're not the same person as the user so there's going to be a difference there and that's going to result in biases and mistakes. Yeah. Okay, uh, the next thing you can do is a user study. So a user study is uh, where you try and bring people into like a laboratory setting and you, you, you get them to use the software and then you, you test it. Uh, user studies usually, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it in, in a little bit, um, but you want to be able to mathematically measure things or put numbers on, on things. Uh, and if you use somewhere less than 20 users, you probably won't have enough users to, to get good numbers, okay? So 20 is kind of like the minimum to get something called statistical significance, which we'll, we'll talk about in a bit. Um, and you, you, you can do as many users as you want, um, but if you do more than 200, it just, it become, it's very logistically challenging. Like uh, making appointments with the users, having them come in, some people don't show up. You need someone that sits there and actually does it with them. And so it, it gets like pretty tedious even, even 20 users is, is a lot of work, having done it. Um, but, but yeah, so, so, so usually you don't see many studies that would be more than 200 or, or something like that. Unless if it's online. So some studies, I think there's a slide about this, some studies you can do online. Uh, then you can recruit 2,000 users because it's all automated. It's not, you're not actually sitting with the users themselves. Okay, so the user study goes like this. It's kind of a long process. <clears throat> so the first thing before you do anything, if you get real humans to do something, you need what's called ethics clearance in a university setting. In the corporate world, you may or may not need it depending on how the company's set up. Probably you wouldn't need it. Um, so ethics basically is a bunch of other professors or other university people, and you tell them what you want to do, and they'll either say yes or no, or they'll say change it. Um, ethics exists more for things like medical studies, like if you're injecting drugs into people and things like that, like they, they don't want you just doing that on your own, right? So that's why ethics boards are set up. Um, but they do apply to security and there are a few like little things around security that, that you have to be uh, careful with. Um, 
So the, uh, for example, if you, say you want to do a study on like the passwords that people choose. You can't actually ask people to give you their passwords because then you could turn around and log into their accounts. So that's an example of something that wouldn't pass ethical clearance. Um, you take a lot of data about people uh, because you need to model the statistics. What do you do with that data? Do you leave it on a computer? Do, do all my grad students have access to that computer so they could see everyone's data? Do they see the phone numbers of all the people that are coming in and they start texting them or things like that? Like, so you have to think about data retention, who has access, when do you delete it, uh, that kind of thing. Um, another thing is uh, most studies will use what's called deception. So for example, let's say that I want to test, um, well, let's say I want to do some sort of passwords thing and somehow I get it past clearance. I could bring you in and say, hey, we're doing a study on passwords. You know, go set up a password. Now you're thinking, oh, this is a security person. They're doing a study on passwords. You're going to take, you're going to like set a really good password because, you know, this is a study about the security of passwords, okay? And that's going to bias the results. So what I'll do instead is I'll say, hey, I'm like studying a new game and I want you to play the game and tell me whether it's fun or not. That's what the study's about. And then I'll say, okay, first you have to, you know, create a username and password. And then once you have that, we'll play the game. So you create the username password, then we play the game. And actually the whole study is about the password. It has nothing to do with the game itself. The game is just a distraction. It's meant to make you behave in a more realistic way. Okay, so that's called deception. Deception is permissible. Okay, it's basically the only way you can get good results. But the rules around deception are basically you tell the person at the end, by the way, that whole thing that we did, it actually had nothing to do with the game. It was just about the password. Okay, so that, that's, that's more or less it. Um, yeah, and so the ethics board will go through your application. They'll either approve it, they'll deny it, or they'll uh, send it back for, for changes. Uh, it also takes a long time, so it uh, could take you know months on the order of months type of thing to, to get it done. Maybe that's a long or not long, I don't know, depending on your perspective. But if you were, for example, like I'm going to do user study for my course project in this class, you're not going to be able to do that because you won't get ethics in time. Okay, then you have to get some users that are going to participate in your study. You want to pay attention to how you recruit your users. Okay, so the main thing is you're going to advertise it. Where you advertise it, though, could have an impact, right? So, uh, for example, a lot of university studies will advertise, like, to university students through email, through, you know, even, like, like pieces of paper that are on bulletin boards around campus and things like that. If you advertise on a university campus to students, who is going to come into your study? It's going to be a bunch of students. Okay, it could be non-students that happen to see it, but you're going to get a ton of students, right? So now that's either good or bad. Maybe you're, you're making software for students, then that's what you want, but maybe you're making software for, I don't know, accountants or something like that, then maybe a bunch of students aren't really representative of what you want, okay? So you want to think about recruiting. Um, you have to think about who's the actual target user group for your software, and then how can I recruit people that are as close to that as possible? Um, universities also tend to maintain lists like university groups. So they'll have a bunch of people that have participated this, you know, in the past and you could get that list and, and work from it. Um, there's online platforms like Mechanical Turk, uh, Cloudflower. I don't, I don't know the current status of, of all these. Um, but, but, but anyways, you can, um, you can use these platforms and then you just advertise it and, uh, and then users can do it. Uh, these online platforms is a completely automated thing. So they just, they do your study, but you're not watching them do it. You just get the end results of, of what happened. Um, Mechanical Turk is used a lot. So people spend a long time trying to figure out what the demographics of the, the typical user on that website is. And so there are some papers that just give you what the demographics are. So you can take that and then you can figure out what demographics you want and you can do some re-weighting or, or, or whatever. Okay, so now we have a bunch of users and uh, we have our ethics. So now we're ready to do the study. Before we do the study itself, we tend to do a questionnaire where we try and get the demographics off of the users themselves. 
Um, so like age, education level, income level, expertise are things that could be relevant. Um, and then what you might do is you might select some people to participate or not. So you might do a filtering process where you're looking for only people with a certain level of education, uh, either high or low. Um, and, and so you might, if you get a lot in one kind of group, you might filter people out, that type of thing. And if you can't get the exact, you know, you can't get the demographics that you want, uh, then you, you can use statistics at the end to try and like be like, oh, this person counts for twice, their, their opinion counts for twice as much as this other person because they come from a smaller underrepresented group in our city. So to some degree, you can manipulate it statistically, but the best thing is to just have, have the exact demographics that you want at the start. Okay, then you're going to do the user study. Now, the next thing you should do is, first off, user studies are typically paid. Okay, uh, payment is either one of two forms. It's either just a flat fee. I'll give you $20, I'll give you $200, whatever, uh, to do it, and then you, and then you get paid. Uh, sometimes they'll do more of a raffle kind of thing. Like, we'll give you, we'll put your name in a draw, and at the end of the study, one or three people will get an iPad or something like that. So that's the other way of, of doing it. So you're not guaranteed to, to get anything out of it. Um, but it's more typical to just pay every user uh, directly. Now, you might think you'll pay them at the end, right? And maybe you would withhold payment if they don't do a good job, or maybe they leave halfway through or something like that. Um, but what you should do is pay them at the start, okay? And their payment should not be contingent on the study itself. If someone gets halfway through user study and they're bored, you actually want them to leave because they're going to bias your results. Like they're not, they're going to stop caring and they're just going to do whatever and then you'll get bad results, okay? Um, and so you don't want to withhold payment to the end. You don't want payment to be contingent on finishing. You want people to, to come in and, and if, if for whatever reason they want to leave, you want to let them leave, okay? So you, it's sort of counterintuitive, but you pay them at the start of the user study and they're free to leave at any time and they still take payment um, whether they complete the study or not. Okay, then we're ready to do the actual study. Um, so the user studies are hard. You have to design them down to every detail. Usually you do it in kind of stages. So you do a pilot study where maybe you bring five people in, you try and figure out whether the study's working or not. Then you bring in uh, more people and then finally you're ready to do the study for real and do it with 20 people or 100 people. Um, you typically will either write down your instructions or you'll read it off a piece of paper. So it's kind of boring, but the person who's doing the study will have a clipboard and they'll just read it. The reason you're reading it is so that everyone gets equal instructions, okay? If you freestyle it, you might tell one user more than another user and that might bias the results as well, okay? So to the extent that you can script everything, it's scripted. Now sometimes they'll ask you questions and you didn't anticipate that question you can think about whether you answer or not, and the answer you give might be different. Uh, but, but anyway, so you want to control as many of the variables in the study as you can. And so like things like instructions that you're going to tell every user is one variable that you can control, so you control it. <clears throat> now the next thing you might do is, uh, let's say that you, um, okay, let, let me back up a second. Uh, let's say I have a piece of software, I want to figure out if it's usable or not. I can do a user study that tries to figure out whether it's usable or not. Okay, so that's one kind of study. The second kind of study that's a lot easier to do is called a comparative study. So what in a comparative study, I'm comparing two options. So I might take my system that I think is good, and then I'll take some other system like this, the most popular system, or maybe I have a new version and I give the old version. And so in this case, I'm comparing the two. So the types of things I get from it are uh, just, uh, you know, which one's better or, or which one's worse. Uh, are, you guys want to break your fast? Is that why they're leaving? Or? Okay, the different reason. Okay, anyways, I have that in the back of my mind. So around 6.45, yeah. All right, um, we'll take a break. Um, yeah, so, so anyway, a comparative is, it's easier, it's, it's easier to get 
more concrete data. It's easier to say A is easier than B because that's, that's like a, a very direct statement. If you just say A is usable or A is not usable, it, you don't really know what that means, right? But if you say it, A is more usable than B, then that, it's a little more concrete, okay? So in general, we, we, we um, prefer uh, comparative studies. You, you tend to get more concrete data. Okay, then the next thing is, let's say you have two systems, A and B. So we're gonna run our study. My system is B and the other system is A. The next thing, how, how are you going to do it? So you bring in 20 users. So what you could do is you could make all the users use A, right? And then, uh, and then after you can make them all use B, and then you can do measure the difference between them, and we'll, we'll get to like how you actually measure the difference. Is there any problem that you can think of with what I just suggested? Have people use A, then have people use B. Okay, okay. So they learn something by using A first. So let's say you know nothing about it. You use A, you've at least used that class of software at least once, right? So you're now a little more educated, more experienced with the software. Then you use B, you're coming in with a bit more experience. And so it's going to bias the results in favor of B, okay? So we call this the learnability effect, all right? So how do you solve that? Okay. Okay, okay. So there's two things you can do. One thing is you could reverse it. So you could give half the users A then B, the other half B then A. Or you could just make two groups. One group only uses A, never sees B. The other group uses B and never sees A. Okay? And the best approach is the second one, is to split the groups. Okay? So we call this the between subjects. That's the fancy term for it. But it basically means some... Half of your users will only use A, half of your users will only use B. There's no cross-contamination as a result, uh, and so you can just set aside this whole bias that might result. Okay, so if, if they use A and then use B, then you have a learnability bias. So you split participants in two groups. And then you want to uh, balance your group. So if all your experts are in group A and your non-experts are in group B, then there's going to be a problem, right? So there's two ways to balance your groups. One is you can try and do it manually. So you can go through the demographics and sort of try to sort it out. Or the other thing is you can just randomly assign people and hope that the randomness takes care of the fair distribution. Randomness works well with a large number of participants. So if you have 200 participants and you randomly assign them to groups, they're going to be pretty balanced. But let's say you have three, four users and you do random assignment, right? That might not work. Like you say you have two experts and two non-experts and you just randomly assign it. It is quite possible that two experts end up in one group and the two non-experts end in another. It's only 25%, right? So uh, randomness works better. Uh, uh, randomized trials work better when you have larger numbers of people. Okay, so if you have a small number of studies, you might do a random assignment, but then do a sanity check by checking the demographics. Okay, now the next thing you want to do is, okay, so you do your user study. So what exactly is your user study? Basically, you bring someone in, you say, you know, do this task, do this task, and then you measure what you can measure and then uh, you might ask them questions about it or record how many errors they make and things like that, okay? So you, you have a bunch of data now, basically what happened during the actual study, and you wanna do some analysis, and somehow you're gonna use that to make some conclusions about whether the system is usable or not. Okay, so the two types of data that you can collect are quantitative and qualitative, okay? So for example, um, if users completed the task seven seconds faster on system B than system A, that's quantitative. Okay, that's a number. Seven seconds is the number, right? Um, if users' error rate was 18% on system A and it was 4% on system B, like the number of errors they made, uh, or the number of participants that made at least one error, it's sort of ambiguous. But anyways, all these things are numbers. Okay, they have numbers on them, and so you can uh, do this. Now, if you have numbers or quantitative data, that's very easy to analyze. You can make conclusions like system B is better 
than system A if you consistently see numbers that back that up, okay? So numbers are good, but usability, can you always put a number on things that are usable, right? Like say something has a really nice user interface, something has a bad user interface, can you put a number on that? Not necessarily, okay? Um, so we still want qualitative data uh, from, from people as well, okay? So like, for example, let's say users like system A better than system B, you can't really put a number on that. Or like, how much more do you like it? Uh, that, that type of thing, okay? So they're sort of like feelings about things. Uh, it's, it's hard to put a number on. Okay, now, ultimately, we actually wanna put a number on everything, okay? Otherwise, we're not gonna be able to say anything really about the system, okay? Um, there, there are some forms of qualitative data analysis, uh, but generally they're not used in usability. So a question for you is, is there any way we could convert qualitative data into quantitative data? Is there a way that we could actually put numbers on things that are sort of like people's feelings about using the software? Okay. Exactly, exactly. All right, so there's this thing that all of us have used and more often than you want to have used. And it's actually exactly about this and it's exactly what you say. So what we do, is it has a name, it's called a Lackert scale. And it's the thing that looks like this. There's a bunch of questions, like the website has a user-friendly interface and you say strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, or strongly disagree, okay? And when you answer that, now you have a scale from one to five of what users think, okay? So you can ask them qualitative things and then you can get them to basically answer in a number, and then you can look at all the numbers in group A and all the numbers in group B, and you can see if there's a difference between A or B, and you can do some statistics on it and, and, and see, you know, is that difference actually meaningful or not? Okay, so this is called the Likert scale. Uh, it's used to convert qualitative data into quantitative. Um, all right, so I actually, I already showed you one thing, but what, what are some problems with Likert scales that you can think of? Okay, and why do you do that? Okay, okay, so problem one, too many questions. Has anyone taken a survey like this where there's too many questions? Yeah. Okay, so too many questions, users get fatigued. The result is that they stop caring, they're lazy. One lazy thing you can do is I agree, I agree, I agree, or strongly disagree, strongly disagree, all the way down, okay? So that's one problem. Uh, is there any way you could solve for that problem? So the user fatigue, that, that is basically the problem with Leckard scale. Okay, what about a shorter survey? If you ask five questions instead of five pages of 20 questions, are you going to get better responses, do you think, on, the, on five questions than five pages of 20 questions? For sure, okay? So you can ask less questions. That's one way of doing it. Any other ideas? Uh, do you think users spend more time thinking about question one or question five? Why? Because it's the first, right? You're not, you're tired by question five, okay? So you're gonna get good data on question one, you're gonna get terrible data on question 200. Is there anything you could do to, to, to help? Okay, so you could try and weight them by importance and move them up. Is there anything else? Yeah, so you could randomize the questions, okay? If you randomize them, then sometimes that the question that you're now seeing in position one will be in position five, sometimes it'll be in position three, and all the questions will be kind of equal, right? So you'll get uh, good coverage of, of all of the questions themselves. Okay, uh, how do you combat someone saying strongly agree, strongly agree, strongly agree, strongly agree, strongly agree? So you say it again? Okay, okay, so uh, one thing you can do is you can uh, like swap or reverse the question itself. So you can say, for example, question one says, uh, the website has a user-friendly interface. I, I strongly agree with that statement, okay? Now let's say question number two says, 
the website has a terrible user interface. If I answered strongly uh, agree on the first question, what should I answer on the second question? Strongly disagree. Strongly disagree, right? Now, let's say the third question says the user has a user-friendly interface. Given my answers on the first two questions, how should I answer that question? OK, I should strongly agree with it, OK? Um, so what we do is we do consistency checks in two ways. One thing is we actually ask the same question more than once, not always phrased exactly the same. So it might not be a verbatim, but it's basically asking you the same question with different words. And we're trying to see that you answer them consistently, OK? And the second thing we do is we swap or reverse the question. Uh, and we ask the opposite question, and then we do a consistency check it where if you answer the positive version with agree, you should answer the negative version with disagree and vice versa. Okay? So those are the uh, ways of sort of checking consistency. If we see that you're answering inconsistently, then we might remove you from the study or we might lower the weight of your opinion on the study, that kind of thing. Okay, so we can shorten the survey. We can randomize the order of questions. Uh, we can do these consistency checks. And those, those, those are just some principles for, for Likert scales. OK, the last thing you want to do is you want to do some analysis of the data and the results. Uh, the gold standard is to do some sort of statistical analysis. Statistical analysis uh, is something that requires expertise. I'm not an expert in statistics at all. I hate statistics. I did poorly. I haven't taken it since high school, and I, I did poorly in it. So uh, I can't teach you about statistics, but I can tell you the big picture as I understand it. And if you ever do a user study, you need to bring in someone that knows what they're doing in terms of statistics, which we did. When we do them, we, we work with other collaborators that know this stuff. Um, so the basic test that you're trying to do is you, you write what's called a hypothesis. So a hypothesis would be like system A is more usable than system B. Okay, that's your hypothesis. Maybe it's true, maybe it's false. You can either prove the hypothesis is true. You could disprove it, meaning that B is, is greater than A, better than A, or you could end up in the middle where you can't decide. So there's basically like three kinds of outcomes, okay? Um, now, the second thing is, let's say that the statistics are leading you to believe that, that your hypothesis is true. So they, you do some measurements and system A looks better than system B. Okay, you run a user study, you run it with four users, two are experts, two are non-experts, two experts use system A, they think this is great, and the two non-experts use system B, and they say this isn't great. Your statistics tell you very strongly that system A is better than system B. Does that mean system A is actually better than system B? That's one outcome. So there's two ways to interpret the results. Result one is the hypothesis is true, and that's why you're seeing those statistics. The other outcome is, well, when we randomly assign people to groups, all the experts happen to get into one group and they didn't get into the other. So that might also be an alternative explanation. Okay? So the next thing you have to do is you have to separate those two. So you can ask yourself, well, what's the probability that all the experts end up in one group? So it's going to depend on how many people you're running through your study. So if you're running four, it's 25%. Right? If you're running 200, and you have four experts, it's, you know, I can't even do the math, 100 choose two or whatever, I, whatever it is. I'd, anyways, yeah, whatever. It's some, some much smaller probability, okay? And so that's something that your statistic model will take into account as well, uh, as well, okay? So first off, it's going to try and measure what's the difference. So if, if system A is much stronger than system B, then you're going to have big differences that are quantitative big number differences. And if it's sort of a subtle difference, then the numbers are going to be closer. There will be a difference there. So the bigger the effect, the less people you need to conclude that it's not random chance. If you're trying to measure something subtle, then you need a larger number of people to figure out whether it's just by random chance or not. Okay. So this is sort of the feeling of how statistics work. Okay. So the hypothesis looks true. And it's more likely that it's actually true than just random chance. That's one thing that you might conclude. You might conclude that the hypothesis looks false, meaning the exact opposite is true. And it's more likely false than random chance. Or you might conclude it's somewhere in the middle. So it, it looks true or false, but it's within the margin of error that this could actually just be due to random chance. Okay? 
And so the third thing is the thing where you don't get any results. You don't know anything more at the end of the study than you did at the start, okay? Maybe you have a hint at it. And how do you fix the third thing? The, the main thing you do is you just run more people through the study, okay? You, you run them through until you either get the first or second, okay? Um, that, that's the correct way of doing it. <coughs> the other way people do it is they tweak the statistics until they get one of the two things, which is called p-value hacking, and it's very bad, and you shouldn't do it. They change the hypothesis until they get one of the two. Okay, and so uh, if, if you're in one of the first two cases, uh, we say it's statistically significant. Okay, so the difference, the hypothesis is uh, statistically significant um, that it's true. So very roughly speaking, if you have a really large difference between, say, in a comparative study between A and B, uh, 20 users, you can probably get statistical significance that A is better than B. If it's a subtle effect, then you would need more like 200 uh, in order to, to statistically be confident that it's not due to just random chance. Uh, as mentioned, it requires a lot of expertise. Uh, so if you ever find yourself doing this, make sure either you know statistics well or you collaborate with someone that does. Okay, so the pros of a user study are you test it with normal people. So you test it with, you're bringing normal people into, uh, into the lab and that, that's who you're studying it with. Um, the cons of it is that even though they're normal people, they still might not be your exact demographic, right? So you might be making software for one type of people and then you bring in a bunch of university students and they're, they're normal too, but they're normal in a different way. Um, so you, you still might have malignment uh, between your two, how representative it is. Um, the next thing is that you uh, have, there's not a lot you can do with a user. By the time you explain, you're going to explain something to them, it's going to take five, ten minutes. And then they're going to do something and you have to write down everything they're doing so they're kind of doing it slowly enough and they're asking questions and things like that. So the amount of software that you can get them to use in 30 minutes is not a lot. Okay, so you can only test like maybe one core task or, or something like that. So you can't cover a lot of the software without making super long sessions, but then people get fatigued and things like that. Okay, um, lab environments are intimidating. So people come in and there's someone with a clipboard and they're watching everything they do. You're going to behave very carefully, right? You're going to think twice about everything you do. Is that how you're going to behave at home? No, not at all, okay? So we call that the ecological validity. So something that you see in a lab setting doesn't necessarily reflect the behavior you would see when people are comfortable and at their home. Uh, because of the time of running the study and all the setup and all that type of thing, um, they, they tend to be expensive both in terms of money, you have to pay all the users and you have to pay the people to run the study and things like that. And it's a lot of time setting up the study but then also just running the study. Right? You bring people in, you know, you, you, can, you have an eight-hour day, so you can maybe bring eight people in, but three people will cancel and not show up and things like that. And so it takes a long time to actually even do 20 users uh, through a user study. Um, and then sometimes you have usability issues that show up over a long period of time that don't show up in a short period of time. So, um, or sometimes people actually reverse their feelings. So someone after 30 minutes might think, I really like this, but then they go use it for four hours and they might think, actually now I kind of think it's annoying, okay? So the difference between uh, a small consumption of something and a large consumption can change. So I have a story about that, um, which also has nothing to do with security, but it sort of drills the point home. Yeah. Okay, okay. So uh, why don't we take the break early uh, and then uh, 15 minutes kind of thing? Yeah. So like maybe come back at 5.05, 7, 7.05? Yeah? Okay, okay, cool. And then I'll tell you about the Pepsi chat. All right. Okay, so uh, let me uh, just go back. I, what I want to do is tell you a story about uh, long-term issues and how you might miss them. And this is sort of a fun story that has nothing to do with, uh, with security, but it kind of drills the point home. 
So it has to do with this, with this thing called the Pepsi Challenge. Okay, so this is an advertising campaign. As you can tell, it was in the 80s, maybe, um, called the Pepsi Challenge. Uh, you might have missed what's happening. I'll just mute it and uh, play it again. But what you can see is that they, uh, it's actually like a blind taste test, okay? And so what Pepsi did is they went into grocery stores, and they had a person that worked for Pepsi there, and they had like a can of Pepsi, a can of Coke, their nearest rival. And they would give you a sample of, of each of them, but they wouldn't tell you which is which. Uh, users would take a, a, a test, taste test. Uh, and then lots of users drank the Pepsi and said, this tastes really good compared to Coke. Okay? And so uh, they bought Pepsi. It was very successful for Pepsi. Uh, Coke actually got worried about it uh, because it was so successful. Okay, now why do you think Pepsi beat Coke? Does anyone have an opinion on why that might be the case? Okay. So it could be that like people just have, they're already in the Coke camp or the Pepsi camp. How many people here like Pepsi better than Coke if you had a choice? How many people like Coke better than Pepsi? Okay, and how many people don't drink either of them? Yeah, that's good. All right, um, all right, so Coke is slightly edging out Pepsi at this point. Um, okay, let's say you're a Coke drinker and you drink Pepsi, why don't you like it? If you, if, for all the people who said, I like Coke better, for you people, uh, let's say you go to a restaurant and they only have Pepsi, why, why don't you like it? Why doesn't it just taste the same? No, why, what's different? About it? Put some words or description on, on why it's different. Okay, so less carbonated? Yeah. Okay. You're shaking your head. <laughs> yeah, okay, so same thing, right? So there's no real difference between them? Okay, one, one difference, at least in the 80s, maybe it's less so today, is that Pepsi is actually quite a bit sweeter than Coke. Okay, so it, uh, the sugar, the taste of sugar, whether it's real sugar or not, is, uh, whereas Coke has kind of like got a less sweet kind of taste. Um, so anyways, back at, at, in this era, that was like the main distinction uh, between them, okay? And so the hypothesis was that Pepsi is actually winning not because people are loyal to Pepsi or loyal to Coke. It's actually winning because when you taste them both back to back, you're like, oh, this one tastes better because it's sweeter, okay? So that, that, that's the going hypothesis. So Coke looked at it and said, okay, we got to do something about this. Um, so I should say Coca-Cola looked at this because that was the original. And so they said, we're getting slaughtered like in our sales because of this Pepsi challenge. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a new version of Coca-Cola that's going to beat Pepsi at this uh, challenge. Okay. So they went away and they did lots of lab experiments and things like that. I don't know who knows what happened. And they came out with this thing called Coke. Okay. Now it's Coke as opposed to Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola was the original. Some people call this new Coke because uh, the can says new and Coke on it. And maybe the most controversial thing they did is they actually replaced Coca-Cola. So they're not like, now we have two drinks. We have the Coca-Cola that you've always loved and now there's this new Coke. They were just like, Coca-Cola is dead. Now it's all Coke instead, okay? And so they ran a lot of these user studies themselves, okay? And they, uh, they felt very confident that they were going to beat Pepsi. And so they rolled it out. They had lots of publicity. And they went to grocery stores and they started uh, doing what Pepsi was doing to them. They would give people blind taste tests between the new Coke and the Pepsi. Okay? And you know what? They won. People took a sip of new Coke. They took a sip of Pepsi. And they liked new Coke better. Okay? So new Coke was, they, they did something right. Okay? Now new Coke was sweeter than old Coke and, and maybe even sweeter than Pepsi, 
Okay, so that was one thing. And it had a kind of citrusy kind of flavor. So somewhere between the sweetness and the citrusy flavor, people seemed to like it better than Pepsi. So what did people do? They would buy a case of new Coke and they would go home. Okay, now this is where there was a problem. Okay, they went home and they drank an entire can of new Coke. And all of a sudden, the thing that they like, kind of liked when they took a sip of it, you know, that it was sweet and had this kind of citrusy flavor. Once you get halfway through a can or all the way through a can, you think, oh, this is, it's kind of gross. It's too sweet. It's kind of like syrupy. And then you drink two or three cans across a couple different days. And by the end, you're like, this, I, I don't like this at all. Okay. Uh, and so New Coke was this huge flop. Okay. Everyone hated it. They thought it was disgusting. It was better than Pepsi at the Pepsi challenge. But once people drank a lot of it, they really hated it, okay? Now, what does this have to do with usability? Usability can be like this, okay? There's certain things that you can do, and for the first five minutes that users use it, they really like it, and they think it's good. But then you get them to use it for a couple days or weeks, and they, it starts to get really annoying, okay? So an example, oh, by the way, this is called a SIP test. Uh, so it's from the book Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, where the story... So here's an example. I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember this, uh, but Microsoft Word at some point decided, hey, users struggle with like doing basic tasks, okay? So we're gonna add this like little animated clip art thing. It's like a paper clip. It literally dances around. It's not just a static thing. And it's gonna be like, hey, do you wanna do this? Do you wanna do that, okay? This is, I don't know the story behind it, but to me, it's just like kind of obvious. So this is speculation. But like, this is the kind of thing that would test well in a user study. Because the first time you see it, you think, oh, that's actually pretty useful, right? Like it, it asked me uh, if I want to get help with writing a letter, and I'm actually writing a letter, and it's going to guide me through the user interface and things like that. Like that, that I like that, right? So the first 20 minutes or 30 minutes you're in a lab, you use this thing, and you're like, that's, that's a great improvement, right? Then you go home, and you've written 10 letters, and on your 11th letter, this thing is still bouncing around asking you like if you need help with your letter. You don't need help with your letter anymore. You're annoyed with it, right? And so you, this is another thing that, that um, was like tested well in usability, but then uh, doesn't, people don't like it. They get tired of it and, and it became well hated and there's lots of memes about it and, and things like that, okay? So with user studies, you have to be careful about this last issue in particular, which is you get someone for 30 minutes, things that they like after 30 minutes aren't going to necessarily be the thing that they like after a month of using, of using it. Okay, the last thing you can do is a field study. So field studies are kind of actually more or less the gold standard. Uh, they're, they're better, strictly better than a cognitive walkthrough or a user study in terms of the quality of the science that they give, uh, but logistically they're, they're challenging, which is why we don't use them all the time. <coughs> so the idea is that you have system B and you think it's better than system A. Uh, let's say you work at a company and you, know, you have 100 employees and they're all using system A. What you'll do is you'll do a between study study and you'll give system B to 50 of the people that work at your company, maybe randomly assigned, and the other 50 will keep using A. Okay? And then what you usually would do is try to automate the data collection in all ways possible. So when you give them a copy of system B, it comes with some data collection so you can measure like how long they take to do certain tasks and things like that. And then at the very end, you can start asking them questions or halfway through or, or whatever you want to do. So an example of a nice study that was done by some people at Ottawa and Montreal <coughs> was they, um, they actually gave people laptops. They said, here's a free laptop, it's yours. Uh, but we're going to instrument it, and we're interested in like why, why you get malware. Like what was it that you did that led you to get malware, right? Um, so in exchange for having this laptop, we're going to study your behavior basically for four months. 
And the software had all this like automated like tools and things like that so it could collect things. And, and then there was a lot of privacy around it too so it wasn't keeping you know, detailed logs about every website you went to or things like that. But if you happen to get infected with malware while you were in the study, then they would have a lot of data to, to learn how that actually happened, okay? So that's a very expensive thing to do. Right, giving, even if you have 20 people in your study, to give 20 people laptops that might be $500 to $2,000, you know, times five, um, or times 20, uh, you know, it's expensive. You have to spend a lot of time implementing all the data collection and things like that. And you also don't want, especially in a more of a corporate environment, if you make a mistake when you give people system B, half of them are using system B, but there's something wrong with it, then, they're not being able to do their job, right? And it's hurting the company, uh, their bottom line, right? So companies don't want you just experimenting on their employees, you know, over nothing. Like they want to be really sure that it's a solid experiment and it's useful to them in the end. <clears throat> okay, um, a, a way of doing a, a field study is, uh, this is sort of a different way of looking at between subjects, it's more or less the same thing. Um, uh, so sometimes in field studies it's called an A-B test, but it's, it's more or less the same thing where you, you split your users into two sets. Half of them get A, half of them get B, and then you look for differences. Um, A-B testing is now like kind of part of the fabric of a lot of stuff that happens on the web. Like it's very well known. Uh, I, I could poll you like how many of you have heard of it, but anyways. Uh, so like Google, for example, let's say you buy AdWords from them, right? They'll give you a user interface where you can do A-B testing. So what you could do is you could um, write your ad one way and then write your ad a slightly different way, use different language or whatever you want to use. And then when users come and they're going to show them the, the ad, they'll show half of them ad A and half of them B, and then they'll give you some data about like more people clicked on A than clicked on B, okay? So like for example, here's a website, there's a blue learn more button and there's a green learn more button with a little arrow icon, okay? So 52% of people that saw this clicked learn more and 72% of the people that went here clicked on the green button, okay? And the idea of A-B testing also is that you evolve it. So you learn green works better than blue, then you might try two green buttons with different fonts or you might try a green one with the arrow or without the arrow. And so the idea is that eventually you'll get like kind of the perfect uh, website that, that uh, where you get the most follow through. Okay, so the pros of a field study is you have strong ecological validity, uh, meaning that the users that are in your study are your actual users. If you're, you know, if you're writing software for people to use in a company, right, giving them, the people in the company, your software, they're exactly the same, okay? So the ecological validity is strong. Um, you have strong, or sorry, 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 I said this wrong. Uh, that's strong representativeness. So representativeness is how, how well your users match your ideal users, how, many, how well the users in your study match the demographics of the users uh, that you uh, will be giving the software to. Uh, strong ecological validity is, remember ecological validity is I bring you into the lab, you're really intimidated because it's a lab setting so you're on your best behavior, okay? If you're just going to work and I put some software on your computer, you're just using it in the context of work, you're using it for a couple of months, you don't even know that you're part of a study. Okay, so you're going to use it the same way that you would use it uh, like to do your work because you're literally doing your work with it. Okay, so the ecological validity is also very strong because you're using it in your natural environment. Or if I give you a laptop and say it's yours for four months, you'll take it home and you'll use your laptop at home like you would any other laptop. Okay, so your behavior is not really changing uh, because you know that you're part of a study and you're not like in a university room with someone with a clipboard watching everything that you do. Uh, you can deploy it to a large set of users, depending on how many uh, employees you have, but like you can get numbers like 200 or 600 or 1,000 like relatively easily. Um, you can measure over a long time frame, so you can run your field study for months, 
So things like Clippy and the Pepsi challenge, like those problems, you're going to weed those out because, you know, users might like it for the first day or two, but they're going to hate it after a month or two. So you, it's, they're going to be using it long enough that you can see those types of problems. Um, across a couple of months, say you have 200 users using the software for four months, somewhere, sometime, those users are going to use every aspect of the software. Like every menu item, every button will get clicked at some point, probably. And if there's a button that never gets clicked by no, no, if you have 200 users that use your software for four months and none of them ever click one button, then you might think about whether you need that button or not. Um, and uh, the other thing is that um, this is a big problem with user studies too, is you think you know how users are going to behave. And so you write a study or you do a cognitive walkthrough, you behave the way you think behaviors, users are going to behave. Uh, you do your user study, you ask users to do the thing that you think that they're going to do. Okay? But sometimes users do something completely different. Okay? And you have no way of knowing that they're going to do it different. And you test it for the way you think they're going to do it. So you have a lot of data about that but then you don't, you completely miss the way that users actually use it, okay? So the people writing the studies can't always, they don't have perfect knowledge of how users are going to use things. So they miss things, okay? Um, whereas if you do a field study, you're just sort of like use it. Do, do whatever you're going to do, and then you sit back and you, you watch how people use it as opposed to, um, yeah. So an example of that, uh, just, before I do it, is this kind of thing. Um, so this could be a university campus. And what do you see in the middle of the grass? OK, a pathway. Uh, so the university put that pathway there? No? OK, why, why is there a pathway there? OK, so users want to go to that building. They want to take the shortest path possible. The shortest path is through the field. OK. Um, are there no sidewalks in this university? No, there's probably sidewalks, right? So what went wrong? What went wrong is people, the people who designed the si so sidewalks thought they knew where users want to walk. And the way users want to walk was different. Okay. Now, the best thing you can do in this scenario is put a sidewalk. The users are telling you where they're walking, right? So why don't you just put a sidewalk there, right? And so that's the opportunity you get with a field study. So you can see this kind of, we call it where pathing. Okay, so users use it in a certain way. You didn't expect it. You put the sidewalk somewhere else, but you see users are using it in a different way. It's actually an opportunity. Sometimes universities will put up pylons or fences because they don't like this kind of thing. Okay, but you could also embrace it and say, well, this is what users want. Let's give the users what they want. And you put a sidewalk exactly where they're telling you that they walk anyways. Okay, so anyway, that, that's something you can learn from a field study. A literal field study in that case. Um, okay, so the cons of a field study are, I mean, they look fantastic, right? From usability, they, they look great. Why wouldn't you just do a field study all the time? So the main cons with them is just that they're logistically challenging, okay? They're expensive. You have to uh, instrument the software so that it does all the automatic data collection. You have to convince a company to be guinea pigs you know, for your experimental software. Uh, and then if you screw up, then people can't do their day-to-day -day job, and then that's hurting the company as well, okay? So you have to make sure it's highly polished uh, or it's going to threaten the productivity uh, of, of the workers themselves, okay? So that's why we don't do field studies all the time. Now, what people usually would do is they would actually do all three. So these aren't mutually exclusive. You don't have to choose between a walkthrough, a user study, or a field study. You can do all three. And usually what you would do is you would start sort of from easiest to, to, to hardest. So you would do the cognitive walkthrough first because it's easy. You just get the expert. And then whatever issues you see, you try and fix. And then to really see whether you fix them, or to try conversely to understand if, if they're actually real issues or you miss things, you might do a user study that's targeted at that one specific thing. So there might be one thing that a cognitive walkthrough picks up. You design a user study to look at just that one thing. And maybe you do a couple user studies. And then now you feel like it's really good. It's polished. Now it's ready for a field study. And then that's sort of your last check. 
and then it does well in the field study, then you, you implement it, you switch your software, or you update the version of the software uh, to, to the new version. Okay, so uh, that's actually it. So it was a little quicker. Uh, is there questions about usability? There's one thing I'm going to circle back. Someone asked me about social engineering, so I don't get up and leave quite yet, but on usability itself. Yep. Yep, so that, that's the threat. So it's, um, anyways, it's, it's here somewhere. But um, the, uh, yeah, so there's problems, I guess, in both directions. Here we go. Um, okay, you do want to motivate the user, but usually people, they come, they've already come all the way to the university. Right? And so I think the number of people that would be like, I made a special trip to come here. You're paying me to do something for you. I'm just going to grief you by taking the money and running. I think that's like pretty rare. Like most people wouldn't be like that. So it is a possible threat, right? It's possible that someone could do that. Um, but then you'll remember it for next time too, and then they won't do any user studies in the future. Um, so I think that kind of problem, yeah, it, it, it's in, it's a less worse problem than the opposite, which is somebody wants to leave, uh, but they want to get paid. So they're just going to sit there and do the bare minimum in order to get paid. But because they're not trying, then you're not getting good results from them. Um, so I think that's like a worse outcome than you just end up paying someone for, for, for doing nothing. Um, yeah, yeah. So both, both of them are problems. But anyways, the, the second one is worse. So that's why you pay them first. Does that make sense? Other questions? Okay, let me uh, just take five minutes to go over story number four in social engineering, uh, just to make sure it, it was a little confusing, I guess. Um, so you'll recall from this story, uh, it concerned a Bitcoin exchange. Um, and so this Bitcoin exchange is actually in Ottawa. Uh, so it was kind of local. The amount of money that got stolen is very small in terms of Bitcoin hacks and blockchain hacks. Like you now see like blockchain hacks of hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so this was uh, $100,000, but it was super easy. Um, so what happened is, uh, let me start from the start, so at the end. Um, okay, so the way a Bitcoin exchange works is it's kind of like a bank. Uh, it holds money uh, and it lets people, if you have Bitcoin and you want Canadian dollars, it will do that exchange for you, and vice versa. If you have Canadian dollars and you want Bitcoin, it will find someone that wants the opposite of you. It will match you together, and then you can swap, okay? The way an exchange has to work is if it's going to do the swap for you, it has to have your Bitcoin already, and it has to have your Canadian dollars already. It's the only way it can do it. Otherwise, it would say, okay, you swap with that person, but then the two of you would actually have to swap, and maybe one of you swaps and the other one doesn't and it ends up being a big disaster, okay? So the way they work is they take everybody's Canadian dollars that want to buy Bitcoin, and everyone who wants Bitcoin, they take their Bitcoin. They hold on to both of those things. So they have a bank account that has everyone's Canadian dollars, and they have a computer server that has everyone's Bitcoin because it's digital, okay? Then they have an internal ledger that says, I owe Alice 10 Bitcoin. I have a big pile of Bitcoin, and 10 of it belongs to Alice, and one of it belongs to Bob, three belongs to Carol, and four belongs to David, okay? And then similarly for their Canadian dollars, uh, they, they would also have a ledger that, that matches that as well. And you might have both. You might have some Bitcoin and some Canadian dollars on the exchange, okay? So at any given time, an exchange is sitting on a big pile of Canadian dollars and they're sitting on a big pile of Bitcoin, okay? Now, because the Canadian dollars are in a bank account, it's hard for me to break in and steal the money out of the bank account. A, because the bank has a lot of security. B, even if I get in, I got to move it somewhere. And as soon as I move it, that's traceable. So the bank will just reverse that transaction. Plus, they'll know who I am because I need ID to open a bank account. And there'll be a police investigation and things like that. Okay, So I could break in and try and steal the Canadian dollars, but it's going to be tricky. Conversely, with Bitcoin, if I can break into the server, get this signing key, 
that signs for all of their Bitcoin, I can move it instantly. And once I move it into my account, it's, a, it's sort of anonymous. And then I can also do things to like kind of obfuscate, like move it around and, and things like that to try and obfuscate it. So when people attack Bitcoin uh, exchanges, it happens a lot. Um, so this is just one small example. There's, there's other ones that have lost hundreds of millions of dollars, like Mt. Gox. Um, the, uh, they're, they're going after the, the cryptocurrency. They're not going after the Canadian dollars. Okay. And so um, the story here, okay, then there's just a bit of detail about how this thing works. So let's say Alice wants, has, a, has $100 Canadian, sorry, she's selling her Bitcoin. So she has 0 0.001 Bitcoin. She's like, I want $100 for it. And then Bob comes along and says, yeah, I'll do that. I have $100 on the exchange already. Then the exchange will do that swap. So it will take the $100 from Bob it will move it to Alice and it will take the Bitcoin from Alice and move it to Bob. Okay. And this is just like a spreadsheet. Like it just, it's just like the, the money's on the exchange. So it's all, it's just changing who it belongs to. Then if you want to get your money off the exchange, you can do that as well. So that's called a withdrawal. And so you could say, Hey, I want to, I want to take my money off my Bitcoin or my Canadian dollars, and then they'll take it off. They'll send it to your Bitcoin address or to your bank account, like in a wire transfer. Um, and then they'll, uh, and then they'll, they'll cut your account, like whatever you withdraw, they'll take off of your account. Okay. Now the point is that in order to withdraw Bitcoin, they have to send the Bitcoin to your address. Okay. So you say, this is my personal address. It's on my phone. I want the Bitcoin on my phone. I don't want it on your server. So I'm giving you my address. You got to send it to my phone. Okay. In order for them to, to send it to my phone, they have to sign a transaction. What that means is to sign this transaction, the key has to be there. You can't sign if you don't have the key. Okay. And because users are withdrawing all the time, the key has to be like on the server. Otherwise it won't keep up. Okay. Like it has to do it in real time, more or less. So all of this to say the key has to be on that server and because otherwise it can't sign these withdrawals. Okay. Um, so you can't keep it locked up in a safe or something like that. Now, what you could do is you could say, hey, I'm sitting on a big pile of Bitcoin. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my Bitcoin in two piles. I'll put a pile that is literally in a safe, like it's in a key and the key's on a thumb drive and the thumb drive's in a bank safe. Okay, like 80% of my Bitcoin is there or 90%. And then 10% I'll put in another key that's on this server. Then if I get hacked, I lose 10% of my Bitcoin, but I don't lose the other 90%. But then the problem with it is, what if more than 10% of users ask to withdraw? Then I run out of Bitcoin on the server. Then I have to like tell everyone, hey, I, I have your Bitcoin. I'm not bankrupt, but I need a couple days because I need to go to the safe and get it out and move it over. So you, you'll be able to do your withdrawal in a couple days. But then users get spooked and they think it was hacked and then they, they all leave. Then everyone wants to withdraw and it ends up being a big problem as well. Okay. Um, so that's, that's the sort of pros and cons of, of how much money you leave on the server and how much do you not. So the stuff you leave on the server, we call your hot wallet. And the stuff that you leave in a safe is called your cold storage or your cold wallet. Um, so anyway, so this Bitcoin exchange was running. It had 100K in its hot wallet. And then it had a bunch more in its cold wallet. Okay, so the attacker only got the contents of the hot wallet, not the cold wallet. And the way they did it was uh, they somehow figured out that this company's servers were not, the company wasn't managing their servers themselves. They outsourced it to Granite Networks, which is owned by Rogers. Rogers is one of the biggest telecoms in Canada. They had a data center. And so the server itself was sitting in a locker in this data center in Ottawa. And so what the attacker did is they went to the website for Granite Networks. They opened one of those chat windows and they basically said, hi, I'm, you know, I work at this exchange. Uh, we're having some problems with our computers. We need you to change them. And Granite Networks didn't do any authentication. So they just assumed that like, because the person knew that that company had a server at this data center, it must be the real company asking for it. And so they said, fine, what do you need? And so they, the news article is kind of weird, but they, they 
kind of went and plugged a computer into it and they rebooted one of the servers were there was there if you reboot it it like um, goes into safe mode which turns off a lot of like firewalls and, and malware and intrusion detection and things like that and um, so we don't know the whole story but basically they they let them do enough <coughs> to the server to get the key off it once they had the key then they moved all the Bitcoin off the server and that was the story cool sorry no nope. so as far as I know no one knows who they were and uh, because they talk through a chat window the only piece of evidence you might have is an IP address right like you wouldn't have anything else you don't know who they are you don't know their name or anything like that. They never talked to them in person. I guess when they connected to the computer, like they would have tunneled into it, there would also be an IP address associated with that. Can you hide your IP address? Yes. Yeah. How? By using some of the VPN capabilities or maybe you can use uh, SDS and VPA to kind of change your IP. OK, OK. So VPNs, Tor, has anyone used Tor? Okay, is it usable, would you say? It's slow. it's slow. How about like setting it up and getting online and things like that? Is it a good piece of software or a bad piece of software? It depends on your usability. What is your main purpose of using it? Okay, so a normal user, all the students in this room, could they use Tor no problem? It is meant for like journalists and dissidents and like everyday users, it's not just meant for IT people. So it's a good question, right? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. This wasn't planned ahead, just kidding. Next class, we're going to come and we're going to use Tor. Okay, and we're going to do a cognitive walkthrough of it. So what I'm going to do is we're going to start the class. I'm going to tell you a bit about how Tor works. It's actually what I was planning on doing already. It's just a coincidence that you brought up Tor. So I'll tell you a bit about how Tor works, because remember, you have to be dual experts, OK? So you have to have the proper mental model. So I'll spend a bit of time on how it works. And then we'll do the walkthrough. I'll show you the guidelines that you can use. We'll actually do it. Uh, and the Tor software, I actually think it's, it's very usable for security software that is doing something as complicated as it's doing, OK? And I've been doing this Tor cognitive walkthrough for the last five years in this class. And Every year it actually gets better. So like five years ago, I would be like, oh, they should change this, they should change this. And then the next year it's crazy, it like gets changed. So I, I don't know if someone like is watching the videos like on the Tor project or something like that, but like it liter they literally like everything I point out gets fixed. So next class might be really boring because it might work perfectly. There might not be anything left to fix. Uh, I might have to make you watch a video from four or five years ago so you can see what it used to look like. But anyways, uh, that that's the, the task for next class, okay? So you'll get hands-on experience, you'll see what cognitive walkthrough is. Then for your assignment, you're going to do it yourself. You're not going to do it on tour, you're going to do it on something else called, you can actually choose. Um, so let me just say a few words about it since we have a little extra time. Um, and you should start looking at your assignment now, even though you don't necessarily know how to do a cognitive walkthrough, you can, um, you can start thinking about how these tools work, what they do, how, what are the core tasks that a user might want to do with them. Um, so you'll look at either Ghostery, uh, which is an ad uh, blocker, uh, but it, what it mainly does is it shows you cookies, uh, and uh, it's more the tracker, I guess, than, than the ad blocker part itself. Maybe I should change it to tracker. There are a couple different things, and some of them you have to pay for. I want you to just do the free thing. Okay, and then one year I thought that they discontinued their free thing, so then I, I offered EFF Privacy Badger, which is free, as a second option as well. So um, Ghostry is probably the more feature-rich one. It's the one to do, but if ever you encounter the fact that it's not free, tell me about it, and then as a backup, you can do uh, Privacy Badger instead. But if you want to do Privacy Badger for whatever reason instead of Ghostery, go ahead and do it. So um, what you shouldn't do is do both. I don't want you to compare them. It's not a comparative. It's just I'm giving you two options in case one of the options one day dies. Um, yeah, so, so that's, that's basically it. So you'll choose one of the two of them. Uh, you'll come up with some core tasks. And then the rest of it I'll show you next week 
uh, when, when you see the cognitive walkthrough. If you really want to get your assignment done this week, uh, you can watch the video from last year. It's on YouTube. It should be pretty easy to find. Uh, if, if you can't find it, uh, send me an email and I'll give you the link to it. But yeah, that's, that's it. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk a bit more about the assignment next week after we do the actual cognitive walkthrough itself. Questions about anything? Yes, uh, so they're out, I think. Uh, yes, that's my son's birthday, so that's my youngest. Um, so it is how everyone guessed. It's like the first Friday after. Um, there's that weird makeup class week, and, and then it's, so it's, is it two, is it, Let's see. Um, I'm just trying to figure out if you have a week between the last class or if it's immediately after. It doesn't make a difference, really, but. Yeah, OK, so the, yeah, so our last class, that's right. We have this weird Tuesday class. Then instead of having the exam on Friday, like three days after, they're giving you a whole week after. So you should be grateful to that. To the powers that be, not me. I didn't choose the date. I might have highlighted the wrong one because I teach two courses, sorry. Um, yeah, so this is, this is my course and then uh, this is also my course. Um, so anyway, so this is the one, yeah. That is actually correct, yeah. So it, they try and match the class time now. So since this is an evening class, the exam would be in the evening as well. Uh, the problem is that our classes, well, they're two and a half hours as opposed to three, so they give a three-hour slot, and then it starts, I guess, slightly later. So anyways, that is real. That is the thing. Um, yeah. Sorry, the exam starts at 7 p.m. Yeah. Yeah, so it will be a Friday night just like this, and you would have started it 45 minutes ago. Now, the exam itself, I will give you the full three hours if you want it, OK? I'm not going to kick anyone out until three hours are up. But I don't try to write a three-hour exam. It's not going to be the kind of exam where you're, you're like struggling to get through all the questions. OK, that's not my style. So I'll give you an exam. The fastest student finishes in 45 minutes or an hour, usually. And then a lot of people will stay for the full three hours. It's annoying, but anyways, that's your right <laughs> to do. Uh, and the average student will kind of leave around maybe two hours. And that's like after going through things, thinking about questions and going back and checking. And so it, it should be very relaxed. You're going to have a lot of time to think about uh, the questions. Um, and if you really want to get out of there, you can, you can just blow through it probably in about an hour. And uh, it will be um, mostly multiple choice, maybe with a couple short answer questions mixed in. And that's, yeah. I'll, I'll talk more about it like maybe a week or two before the exam. The, maybe in the last class, I'll tell you a bit more about the questions and things like that. But um, yeah. Uh, OK, so any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. OK, so the first off, Moodle screws everything up. So Moodle, Moodle only knows about the marks that we put on Moodle. So it will give you some average, which is just a flat average of whatever it knows about. That has nothing to do with your final grade. Okay, So your final grade uh, will be just according to the course outline. Um, so assignment one will be worth 10%. So if it's out of 84 or whatever, then I'll scale it. I'll rescale it so it, you get a mark out of 10. And then same with assignment two, I'll scale it so that you get a mark out of 10. So it'll be worth 10% each. And then your project, you I'll, I'll say it again and again, because students are confused now that we use Moodle. Uh, you'll submit your project through Moodle, but you won't get your mark back through Moodle. So with the assignments, you get your mark back. I don't have time to do it, because the projects, like uh, I always complain about it, but. You, you don't understand what projects are like. So like all of you will do, say, an eight-page eight report, which is actually very short, right? 
but I have to read 100 of them because there's 100 of you. Some of you will work in groups, so maybe I end up with 50. But 50 times 8 is what? 400 pages, right? And everyone, you know, you're going to submit your project. When do you want your mark? You don't want it the next day, but do you want it two weeks later? Probably not, right? You, you want it like in a week or something like that. So I'm reading 400 pages in a week or whatever. So I go through very, very fast. I don't bother putting marks or comments or feedback or anything. So basically, you'll, you'll get a mark. Uh, it will show up in your final mark. Basically, you'll get your final mark. It will include your final exam. It will include your project. It will include your two assignments, which you do know your mark of. Then after you get your mark, you can send me an email and say, hey, can you give me the breakdown? And then I'll, I'll give you the breakdown of it. And then you can say, hey, my exam looks pretty low. Uh, can I come see my exam? Or my project, like what went wrong there? Can, you, can I come talk to you about it? And then I'll say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll set this day aside for students that want to come by and review things, and, and then you can come. So that's sort of like how it works. So you can see everything at the end, depending on how much you care about it. Um, but it, it won't automatically be given to you. You have to ask for it. One year, I'll try and put everything on Moodle. It would it'd actually be simpler. Like, it's more transparent for you to just see everything. Um, and so it's not that I'm trying to hide things. It's just it's kind of a nightmare at the end of terms, like trying to get all your marks in and do everything on time. And I'm teaching two courses, so I'm reading 800 pages, not 400 pages. Um, so anyway, so that's the only reason why they're not on Moodle is just basically just logistics. Okay, other questions about anything? Okay. Yeah, okay, so the final grade um, is, uh, okay, I have never curved down. Okay, so if you take your raw mark and compute what your grade should be, I have never given you like a less, lesser grade than what it is. Um, now we do do, we use letter grades, so you'll get like an A or an A plus or a B, and there's no standard relationship, like what's an A plus, is that 95 to 100, is it 90 to 100? There, there's, that's not written down anywhere, Concordia doesn't use that. So in a sense you're already getting curved because I'm deciding where does an A plus start and end and where does that do, but it will, um, it always has been the case that like, let's say you get an 80, you're not getting a B or something like that. Like you're, you're getting an A minus or an A, or you might even get an A plus with an 80. Depends on, on the class itself. So in the other direction, have I ever curved up? Yes, 100%, okay? And especially for grad students, you can't get anything below a B minus. If you get a C, say you get a C plus, that's actually a fail, okay? So if you get a 50% in the course and you're going past the course, you're getting a B minus, you're not getting a D Right, so that kind of curving up happens, yeah? So all of that is sort of subjective. Um, the promise I make to you is, uh, I actually could curve down. If I had to curve down, I would do it. I just have never done it. So um, yeah, so anyways, and I will fight. If, if I think everyone deserves an A plus, I'll, I'll fight for it. But um, I've never curved down, but it's not a promise that I won't curve down. One promise I will make to you is that if you're sitting here and you have a mark here and your friend has a mark here, if you're here and your friend is here, your letter grade is either the same or better. I'm never going to give like someone a better letter grade. And even if they come to me after and say I really need it and things like that, it's another thing I should dispel is that like your, your grade is basically your grade. Uh, so there's no, you can't do extra assignments or anything like that. Um, if there's a mistake, there's a mistake. I'll correct it and that could change your grade. But at the end of the day, if there's no mistake, there's no, your, your grade. Everyone would want an extra assignment to boost their grade, is my feeling about it. So I can't offer it to select students. Uh, it's either offered to everyone or offered to no one, okay? So um, anyways, that's enough about grade. So probably will bell up. It will probably be in your favor, the bell curve. It always has been in the student's favor. Uh, but there's no guarantees about that kind of thing, other than everyone, in terms of their rank order of grade, will will not receive a grade that's higher than the other people there above them. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, we'll see you all next week. Offline, yes, thanks.